Okay, so um, trying to share my screen here. Can you see it? Is my screen? Not quite. Not quite. Um, Sorry. I've lost the Zoom window now. Oh. Sorry about this. Is it showing up now? Yes. Good. Okay. Okay. So, some of the tide pool program logistics. Um, we have three ways that you can participate. Um, our tide pool education program runs from right now, actually, into uh, June so far. And it's usually on weekday mornings and we accompany um, classrooms and other groups out of the tide pools. And since our tides are, uh, our low tides are in the mornings during the spring months, um, it generally runs from March into early summer. Uh, we don't, um, we can do a special program in the fall, but because the low tides are closer to sunset, um, these are other kinds of organized groups, unless it's Jamila bringing her students out. Um, we have a roving docent program, and it can be on low tide weekends, although you're certainly welcome to go out um, during the weekday, too, whenever you like, as Karen does. Um, I'm getting a message that my internet connection is unstable, so please let me know if I drop out. Um, so what the roving docent does is you can um, go to the beach of your choice, usually for a couple of hours, and you assist um, the park visitors in learning how to explore this very fragile area with both their safety in mind, as well as that of the animals that inhabit this, this wonderful ecosystem. We have a touch table, which was um, developed by the Bodega Marine Lab. And this enables us to bring the animals to the students or to um, people that are participating in events, in different events like uh, Fish Fest in Bodega Bay every spring or the um, seafood festival in um, August, or we can bring them into a school, which we've, we've done a few times with Burnville School. You don't have to get your feet wet. You don't need a really low tide. And um, it's a lot of fun to have hands-on experience with the animals. Um, we have two lockers where we store equipment. One is at the Jenner Visitor Center, and one is at the, um, uh, Salmon Creek Ranger Station. Um, we, hey, we keep two packs, backpacks, with equipment and materials in each. So before uh, meeting a school, um, one of our docents will stop at one of the lockers and pick up a couple of packs. And they contain all kinds of materials that we can use on our field trips. We don't necessarily take everything that's in there, but we meet in the parking lot and sort of pull out what we want to take down on the beach with us. Um, we have um, laminated sheets with emergency contact information. One sheet has talking points that we go over with every group before we go down to um, the beach on uh, ocean safety and also tide pool etiquette. And I send this list out to all of the teachers prior to their arrival because um, kids seem to pay more attention in the classroom than they do once they get out. And they're smelling the ocean air and they see the beach and they're anxious to get down onto it. Um, we also have in this little small pouch down at the bottom, a selection of magnifiers. Um, we will pick up a couple of animals and pass them around in containers full of seawater. And it's one thing to um, see them at a distance or to see them just from a couple of feet away, but sometimes the textures and um, and markings are really quite different and really quite wonderful when you see them magnified. We also have 
different kinds of materials. We have a really nice handout on exploring tide pools. We have some Sonoma Coast State Park maps, um, environmental education programs that we have, volunteer opportunities. This is a really nice handout. Um, it's both on English on one side and Spanish on the other that depicts what a, um, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, help me out, Susanna. What a riptide looks like, how you can recognize it, and what to do if you happen to get caught in. Um, where can I take my dog is a really, really nice pamphlet. Some of our beaches are not dog friendly, others are. And this takes the positive approach of where can I take my dog, not where they're not allowed. And so um, I keep these in my pack whenever I'm at the beach. I'm often at beaches where dogs are not allowed. And um, I'll approach somebody and um, say, you know, I just really hate to see you um, get cited for having your dog here. Um, State Parks does come around and we'll issue a citation and I'd hate to see your day room. This is a list of places where they're welcome. We also have a couple of field guides. Um, my favorite is the seashore Northern and Central California. It's water resistant. It's color coded on the back. Unfortunately, it's out of print. And so we rounded up whatever we can find. We have one in each of our packs. And if it's something that you're interested in, you can find them online. Um, Pacific Intertidal Life is a little handbook that fits in your pocket. It's black and white drawings, but it's really amazingly helpful for our area. It's very comprehensive for our area. The drawings are quite good and the text is quite wonderful. If you'd like a copy of your own, you can get them online for $5. So it's, uh, it's an inexpensive little field guide to um, have with you. This one, a quick field guide to the tide pools. It's full color. It has um, uh, rulers on the side. It's totally water repellent. Um, it's not as comprehensive as uh, the others, but it's, um, it's a handy guide to have with you. And then we have laminated sheets. Uh, the Gulf of the Farallons Limpets program is very generous with sharing their multi-page full color um, limpets field guide. It's very, very strong on algae, if that's your interest. Um, we have um, Max Tidepool Go, which is kind of fun. It has algae on the back and tidepool animals on the front. Um, with short little blurbs, short little blurb of text about each one of them and where they live, if they're in the splash zone, high tide zone, mid tide zone, or low tide zone. And um, this document is in the folder of orientation materials that I linked you to. So if you're, um, periodically I send out the calendar and I ask for people to sign up for field trips with the students. And um, we do quite a bit of organization with the teacher and our docents beforehand. Um, we'll meet in the parking lot, generally about 15 or 20 minutes uh, prior to their anticipated arrival. We'll go through the packs and we'll pull out what we need. And then we stop before going down to the beach. We look at the ocean, we kind of get a feel for the um, energy of the ocean, what's going on with the wave sets. And we do our ocean safety talk and our tide pool etiquette talk. And I'll be going over those. So for ocean safety, um, we always remind them to note safety warnings on signs. Don't turn your back on the ocean. Algae covered rocks are slippery and they're sharp. And uh, we use we demonstrate a three point stance for balance when you're in the tide pools. Uh, stay with a partner, don't go off by yourself and uh, beware of incoming tide. Now, we are not, as docents, we're not responsible for discipline. There are sometimes kids that want to go climb on rocks. Uh, we don't encourage that. And um, this is the um, responsibility of the parent, uh, the parents that accompany and the teacher. Our job, our gig is interpretation and um, to answer questions and to help them explore this environment. There are some rules of tide pool etiquette in order to ensure the safety of the animals. 
Um, we ask that you step on bare solid rocks because um, animals often hide under the algae in order to um, keep moist and cool when the tide goes out. We ask that you don't pull animals off of the rocks. Um, they're there for a reason. Um, sometimes, many of them have blue blood. They have no clotting mechanism in their blood. And so if you yank an animal off of a rock, it can cause internal bleeding and mm -hmm. um, they, they can die. The other thing is, is that they'll never get back onto that rock and they're on that rock for a reason. And they're, they're um, not only on that particular rock, but in a specific um, lateral zone on that rock because some mm. of them prefer to be like in the mid-tide zone where they're covered with water more frequently than they would be if they were on the high tide zone. We, If you handle animals, we ask that you wet your hands with seawater beforehand. One of the problems that they have when the tide goes out is desiccation. They dry out rather quickly. And mm. so if you're handling them with dry hands, of course, your hands are absorbing moisture off of their bodies. And so mm -hmm. um, please wet your hands if you're going to handle them, if you're going to touch them. Always return an animal to exactly where you found it. Um, they were there because that's where they can survive. Mm -hmm. And what I like to do is tide pools are filled with rocks that are really covered with life. And this is where your magnifiers come in because um, there's small little tube worms, um, little tiny um, brooding anemones, all kinds of wonderful things on these rocks. But if you pull one out to examine it, replace it exactly as you found it. There's some animals that live on tops of these rocks, other animals that live underneath. And again, just like with all of the others, they are there because that's where they can survive. And of course, there's no collecting of live or dead animals. Now there's some tide pool programs which, um, um, have a hands-off, no-touch policy. Um, others encourage touching and examining the animals, and we are one of those programs. Um, one of the ways that we engage the students is for them to get close looks and, and examine them and see what's going on with them. And we had one field trip. There's a group of uh, seventh grade life science students that come out every year. And we had a couple of animals in a container of seawater on a rock. And Zach was very carefully inspecting them the entire field trip with uh, a magnifier. And Debbie, his teacher walked by and I kind of subtly pointed him out and she just gasped. She said, oh, he was the last one I would have expected to have been interested in this. And um, he was not out exploring the pools themselves more than a few minutes before he got hooked with um, what he was seeing in the containers that we had. Can I, can I share something? So we get down to yeah, go ahead, Justin. Yeah, and I I just wanted to add to that. Um, you know, the there are some programs that do no touch. We do touch. Um, I just wanted to make sure to acknowledge that, uh, like today, for example, we'll be in Campbell Cove, which is uh, adjacent to two marine protected areas where this is not allowed. Uh, we will be in an area where it is allowed. Um, but generally, it's it's uh, you know sort of an educational exemption that we're doing this um, to to foster understanding. And it's gentle touching. So um, here we are. This is um, Miwok Beach, which um, we prefer to use if we can because you get very good exposure of life on the rocks up to about a one point seven foot tide. So it gives us a little bit more flexibility with scheduling. We're able to schedule on more days where we might not be able to go to another beach. Where we're going today, for example, Campbell Cove, um, Schoolhouse Beach, you really need a minus 0.5 in order to get mm -hmm. to uh, the rocky intertidal areas. And so um, we're limited on accessibility for those days. Uh, Miwok Beach is about a half a mile north of North Salmon Creek where we park. Uh, North Salmon Creek parking lot has restrooms. Um, another reason we like it is that it's adjacent to Salmon Creek. Um, we're walking down along Sandy Beach in order to get down to Miwok. So students are exposed to three different ecosystems on the way down. Hmm. And things, the first thing we like to point out is um, 
we find a rock like this and ask if there are, if the students see any animals on this rock. And I'm wondering if any of you do. It's actually covered with aggregating anemones. And yeah. when the tide goes out, um, their tentacles close up so mm -hmm. that um, they can remain cool and moist. And they cover themselves with sand particles. So this is not only works as camouflage, but also protects them from drying out and from the sun. And these animals, they can reproduce sexually, but basically they reproduce by cloning. And you'll find them on rocks with, um, and you might find groups like these with a seam between two groups of them. The reason the seam exists is that on this side here, we have one clonal family that are all genetically identical because they each animal splits in two in order to form a new animal. And on this side, we have a different clonal family, which is genetically different. And this seam is maintained, it can, it can be maintained for a period of decades actually. And when the tide comes in, um, these animals open up their tentacles so that they can capture food and feed. Uh, they might send a couple of scouts out into, I call it the DMZ or the demilitarized zone in here. And they are exploring ways that they can expand the territory. There's, there's, everybody is competing for real estate on these rocks. And this is no exception. And there are two sets of, um, Oh, here, here are some students that are actually touching and feeling they're very, very moist. But one thing is that the rocks are covered with them. We don't want them climbing all over and stepping on the meter. This is a photograph of an, it's not very sharp because I have it blown up here, but this is one anemone that's in the process of budding. And they can actually walk. And what they do is that one side of the animal starts walking in one direction. The other side starts walking in the other and they stretch very, very thin until they pop apart in the center here. And that's how they become two animals. So that's how they clone. This scene here, I don't know if you can see my pointer, whoops. But this is black, this is black tar algae that is growing in this scene. It's a very, very slow growing algae. And so that tells me that this seam has been maintained over a period of a few decades. When they're covered with water, they open up and they have two kinds of tentacles and anemones belong to the Dinderian family. Uh, the Nigerian family also includes jellyfish and hydroids, and these are characterized by having stinging cells. And um, these blue-green tentacles are their feeding tentacles, and their stinging cells will paralyze um, passing fish or other prey, and um, then bring them bring the prey into the oral disc here into their mouth. Um, those that are on the front lines of these clonal families have a second set of tentacles underneath these white ones here. And these are like missosilos. They contain bundles of stinging cells that they lob at another animal in order to maintain territory or to um, protect the boundary of a clonal family. And you can see, um, some of them are torn, meaning that they've already fired. So this is a battle. This photograph is of a battle that's going on between two anemones. They look like sessile animals. And as somebody said, when they were looking at the videos that were really fascinating yesterday, when you see them on the beach, the tide is out, they're uncovered. They're just rather sessile looking animals, but they become very, very active and actually militant when the tide is in and we're not looking. So that's what's going on in these little areas here uh, during Alice, a high tide. It's a very active area. Alice, we had an anemone question in the chat. Um, Tay asked, 
uh, can an enemy reproduce sexually as well as asexual cloning? Yes, um, this particular species can, it normally doesn't. Um, the giant green anemones that we see, um, they're more solitary. They're not bunched up in tight families like this. Um, they actually spawn. And, uh, oh, I should have a photograph in my slideshow of one spawning because it's really kind of neat to see. But yeah, they'll release sperm and eggs into the water. So they, but they also are able to reproduce asexually. They just don't do it as frequently as the aggregating anemones do. Are there any other questions, Justin? That was it, thank you. That was it. So um, the beaches have been changing over the last few years. And of course, um, this is a function of what's going on with the climate. And I've been visiting Ewok Beach for um, nearly 30 years. And it's been fairly stable throughout that period of time. And a few years ago, we went out there in the spring and these rocks were just covered with this slippery algae. It was all over the place. And um, there have been years when I've seen maybe a little bit of it you know, on these rocks like over here, but this was really, really stunning. And what had happened was it was covering rocks that had been covered with these anemones. And um, this is an annual algae. Um, the following year, it had pretty much disappeared. But so had the anemones that had been living under it. Now, these rocks in the back here still are covered with these clonal families, but these in the front are gone. Um, to be honest, I cannot wrap my head around this. Um, there are anemones that live uh, very close to the sand level. There is a natural winter erosion every year, and then the spring goes back in. So there are some that are buried for part of the year, and they still survive. Um, I do not know if they died and fell off. I don't know if they tried to move away, which is kind of mind boggling since these are very, very tightly clustered groups. But this is an example of one of the changes that we've been seeing in these beaches. Last year, we had scheduled our field trips at Miwok, but there was so much erosion without the redeposition of sand in the spring that um, the beach was very, very difficult to get to. Um, boulders, rocks, which are normally covered by sand during the spring and summer, were still exposed and you had to climb over them to get to the beach. And so what we were doing last year is we were scouting around before each field trip and moved most of them to Furlong Gulch, which is um, a few miles up the road. So every year now we are seeing something different that we haven't seen before also in terms of the animal populations that are there. So it is um, an interesting time due to, and of course this is due to the climate. The reason why uh, we had this incredible perfusion of algae was it had been a very, very windy spring. And with the wind um, comes the upwelling, um, which brings uh, cold nutrient rich water up to the surface which is very, very good for the bird life and for uh, other types of life, including the algae. And that's, we, we think that's why we had that, that overgrowth of the algae for that one year. We do bring a couple of containers, we'll fill them with seawater and um, we can place uh, animals in them to pass around and show around. Um, we're very, very careful not to allow these to sit out in the sun because they warm up very quickly. And again, it's imperative that we return these animals to where they belong and where they came from. Um, this is for Leslie, and they're passing around something of interest here. Leslie is a kid magnet. And it must have been really, really interesting because she's absolutely buried right here. Um, here's a group of students that are exploring. Um, we do have yellow vests that are in our packs that we wear so that um, we can be um, seen on the beach as a docent. 
This is Campbell Cove, and we like Campbell Cove for the younger groups, especially because it faces um, the gentle waters of Bodega Harbor. We're not concerned about um, anybody getting swept up by a riptide or a rogue wave. And um, Sarah here is holding one of the stars of Campbell Cove, which is a big Lewis moon snail. These guys are enormous. These beautiful shells and this huge foot that comes out. And this foot can retreat back into the shell in order to protect itself. Um, if you just poke the body gently, tons of water pours out so that um, it's small enough to retreat back into its shell. This animal is a carnivore. And um, Mollusks um, are animals which not all of them live in shells. Um, an octopus is a mollusk, it doesn't have a shell. And the nudibranchs that we'll look at in a few minutes are mollusks and they don't have a shell. But um, all of them have a special tongue called a radula. Um, a radula um, can be either a file or rasp like tool if the animal is um, a vegetarian. So they use this tongue for scraping algae off of the rocks, for example. If it's a carnivorous animal, that radula can be a drill, often with a chemical assist. And their favorite food are clams and cockles. And this is a characteristic countersunk hole that has been drilled by one of these spoon snails. So if we're out there today, you see a clamshell and it has one of these holes down by the, this is called the umba. Um, you know that uh, moon snails are close at hand. They've been, they've been in the area feeding. And this object here is an egg casing of a moon snail. They're really fun to find. Um, the very first time I saw one in person, I was walking down Dorham Beach and I got very excited. My husband's going, it's a toilet plunger. What's the big deal? Because that's what it looks like. But actually what they do is they exude a mucus along with their eggs and the egg casing is filled with sand, the mucus and the eggs. And um, if we're lucky, we'll see one today. So back to the mollusks and the radula. Even your common garden snail will have a minimum of 14,000 teeth on the tongue, which is really quite amazing. Each one of these animals has um, evolved some kind of weird and wonderful adaptation that's enabled them to survive in this tough environment. Um, this is Campbell Cove. Again, this is a very uh, young group of children. And uh, one of the things about this area is that, um, okay, it's a tide pool group and we're there to see intertidal animals, but um, there are also um, other animals that inhabit this area. And in this case, um, they've noticed down here that there are some animal tracks that belong to a raccoon. And they were really excited because um, this school has a classroom garden and they see animal tracks in the garden all the time. But these tracks led to a hole in the sand where you could see that a raccoon had dug up a clamshell and then led out to the water and the animal had cleaned its food before consuming it. And so the students are really excited. They got to see the whole story in tracks. Um, on that very same day, we looked up um, against the bluff and saw a bobcat walking along and then it just kind of disappeared into the bush as they do. So even though we're out there to look at sea stars and anemones and limpets and all kinds of other good stuff, be aware of what else is around you because there's always a story beyond um, just what's living on the rocks. This is an ochre sea star and this is the most common sea star that we see out there. It is a keystone species, um, meaning that it governs the biodiversity of everything else that lives in its environment. Um, it's a low tide animal. It prefers being lower in the intertidal zone. 
California mussels are a mid-zone animal and the, the favorite prey of um, the sea stars. And they live in the mid-tide zone. And you can stand up on a bluff and look down at Shell Beach, for example, and you'll see black bands across the, the rocks. And these are bands of, these are the mussel beds. And down below, the rocks are clear of the mussels. It's not that the mussels don't want to live farther down on the rock. They do because uh, they would be covered by water more often and um, more frequently and for longer stretches of time. So they uh, are able to remain cool and uh, more feeding opportunities. But the sea stars down below, um, because their predators prevent them from going all the way down to the base of the rock. So what they do is they keep these rocks free and clear of mussels, sandcastle worms, other types of colonial animals, um, which increases the biodiversity of what's living in an area. And during the sea star wasting syndrome in um, 2014, 2015, 2016, we indeed see mussels going all the way down to the sand. And each variety of sea star, if you look closely, you'll see um, a little item on the back. By the way, um, these are spines. Um, sea stars are of the echinoderm family and echinoderms all have um, and spiny skin. And they are also related to, if you take a sea star and you curl up its, its arms, um, you'll have a sea urchin. If you flatten the urchin, you'll have a sand dollar. If you take and elongate it, you'll have a sea cucumber. So these are all different animals that belong to the echinoderm family, all of them with spiny skin, all of them with radial symmetry. Another characteristic is uh, for sea stars is this little item here, and it's a valve. And what that valve does is it takes water into a series of canals, which is a circulatory system, which is goes all the way down to their two feet. And it's a, it's a hydraulic system. So their two, two feet are used for a locomotion. They can move, move with them, but then also for um, feeding. And this is the underneath, you can see the two feet here are grasping the shells of this clam. And what they do is they grip and they'll pull apart those, the clam shells. All they need is a couple of millimeters in order to have access to the animal inside. Now the clams and the mussels, um, they're holding on very, very tight to keep their shells closed, but that is a muscular motion. And so they tire. The hydraulic system never tires. And so the sea stars can patiently wait until they can finally get a little gap and a little opening here. And then they avert their stomachs inside the shell to feed. And here's one, you can see that the shell is open here. And in fact, some of the meat is exposed here. And what this animal is doing is it's actually eating. And one of the videos in the Secret Lives document shows um, a sea star invading a mussel shell, what they had done is that they had a small camera inside the shell and you can see the stomach actually coming in and digesting the soft tissue. Um, actually, it digested alive. And this is what the stomach looks like. Uh, sometimes you'll see them after they've finished eating and you'll see more of it. It's like a glossy thing that's right in the center of the body here. Um, this is another colonial animal that we see out there. This is the sandcastle worm. And um, the sandcastle worms prior to the sea star die off um, were very, very common on Pinnacle Gulch Beach, which faces Bodega Bay. And the only colony on the outer coast um, from Bodega Bay up to Jenner was at Marshall Gulch. There was one small colony on a rock there. With the disappearance of the ochre star, the keystone species, um, this was an opportunity for these animals to um, establish territory on the rock. And 
This is a close-up of the animal itself. I really have a thing about marine worms because they're really bizarre. So this is an extreme macro photograph. These are all grains of sand uh, from one of the tubes in the tunnels. And the tide comes in and they have these wonderful tentacles here, which are grabbing pieces of sand that are washing over them. And they're actually stonemations. They very carefully turn them and um, carefully decide uh, which grain of sand they're going to use for a particular spot as they build their tubes. Hollis? This is, yeah. Uh, before we get too far from the ochre stars, uh, Carol had a question. Um, any idea why the ochre sea stars come in just two colors, the purplish and orangish? Ochre means orange brown, I think, is what Carol said. And they shows. also come in brown. Um, and this is interesting. Um, there have been studies done on um, why they're multicolored. And to my knowledge, and I keep looking, um, nobody yet knows um, why they're multicolored. Um, they spawn, so they send out sperm and eggs into water, and there's a mix. And um, I don't know why some turn out one color, some turn out another. By the way, um, they pretty much disappeared during the sea star wasting syndrome in 2014, 2015, going into 2016. This was due to a um, marine heat wave. It was called the blob. And there were warmer waters. It was linked to a densovirus that had been identified living in these animals 40 and 50 years ago. And so um, this, was a, this was a virus that had always been in them, but they were able to, their immune system was able to keep it at bay. And it is thought that the warmer waters uh, may have increased the replication of the virus, but also stressed the animal's immune system because they weren't able to tolerate the warmer water. Um, they made a comeback, and those that we're seeing today are actually mutants. They, there was a recessive gene in these animals, which enabled them to better tolerate the warmer water and be less stressed. And those are the animals that have survived and that have come back. And so we are actually looking at genetic adaptation in real time out there right now. I have some friends that I used to tide pool with prior to um, the blob. And um, because so many animals disappeared during that time, um, she was depressed by it and no longer wanted to go out and explore the tide pools until beginning to realize that, yeah, we're actually seeing adaptations and evolution in real time. There are 20 different species of sea stars that were impacted by the sea star wasting disease. One of them was the magnificent sunflower star, which um, can be two feet in diameter. Um, it has 20 to 24 arms, very, very fast moving. They don't move slowly like the ochre stars do. And this is an apex predator. Um, we used to see five or six of them on each field trip and we would go out. And by the way, they come in different colors too. They're purple, they're orange, they're kind of a yellow color. And a few years ago, um, they were doing, they were trawling um, um, cold trenches from Baja all the way up to Alaska and found one remaining sunflower star. And what they're doing now is that they're raising them in a lab at the University of Washington, trying to bring them back. Because they're an apex predator, one of their favorite foods was sea urchins. Okay, so they wiped out the sea urchins and uh, the impact that this had on the uh, kelp forest north of us where the abalone lived, um, they just mowed them down. And so this is a whole ecosystem that has been destroyed because of the lack of this sunflower star. Another sea star that we no longer see are the little six rayed stars. They're like maybe an inch uh, in diameter. And um, they come in all different kinds of colors and they're really quite beautiful. And um, they're called proliferating stars or brooding sea stars because in the spring we would see them clutching their eggs and later clutching their babies until their babies were old enough and big enough to fend 
on their own. And they were a major predator of the turban snails. And we have seen a proliferation of, tur of turban snails since losing them. So there are some of these animals are, ochre stars have made a comeback. They had a recessive gene that enabled them to mutate so that they can tolerate uh, these conditions. Um, some of these other animals haven't. And Alice, there's also a follow-up from Karen um, who shared she's been seeing a lot of brown ochre star, a lot of small brown ochre stars at Shell Beach. Um, and she's interested in seeing whether they change color as they get larger. That's an interesting question too. <laughs> There's another interesting thing about ochre stars. Um, it just reminded me of a study that was done in 2009. And um, it, it's a way of thermoregulation for them. Uh, before a low tide, the tide goes out, they will absorb um, lots of seawater in their bodies. It would be the equivalent of you and I preparing for a long hot hike and drinking seven liters of water, if you can imagine, in order to um, sustain ourselves through this hike. This is how they sustain themselves through a low tide. And it's how they tolerate um, the exposure to warm air and, um, and they're less prone to drying out. And this was discovered only, you know, 2009, 15 years ago, not that long ago. So there is more to be learned about these animals all the time. Another type of sea star that we often see are bat stars. Again, these come in a wild array of colors. And um, the reason I like to take a magnifier with me is that when you look at them really close up, they look kind of dull at a distance. But when magnified, you see all of the spines on their bodies and the patterns that they, they make. And they're really, really quite beautiful. And um, this little thing here, the madreporite, this is the valve that they use to bring in water for their um, circulatory hydraulic canals. This sea star is a vegetarian, by the way. Another mollusk that um, we sometimes see at Campbell Cove when they're stranded, um, when the tide goes out, is the red octopus, my very favorite animal. They're also seen at Shell Beach at a really, really low tide. You need almost a negative two foot tide in order to see them out there. And this is a baby. And um, uh, he's on my husband's hand here. You can tell that he's very, very relaxed because his skin is very smooth. It's not mottled, it's not flashing white, it's not bumpy. And he is looking at me. He was watching me the whole time I was photographing him. These are highly intelligent animals. And he was, in, he was as interested in me as I was in him. These are incredible animals. They have um, inside the mantle here, they have an enormous brain, which also extends down into each one of their arms. I just can't imagine how they perceive the world. They have a pair of kidneys. They have a liver. They have all the organs that we do, except they have three hearts. And I do have a stethoscope. I've always wanted to place one on an octopus to see what it sounds like inside. They have one that operates their main circulatory system. And then they have two that are positioned next to the gills. And um, these act like little turbochargers. They have very, very low blood pressure. But when they need to, I'm sure you've seen films of them jetting off in water, often leaving a cloud of ink behind them. And they're able to do this because of the turbocharging of those two extra hearts that give, um, give them an extra dose of oxygen from their gills. Wonderful animals. I'm hoping we see one today. You have to be careful when you're um, moving out towards the jetty on the rocks because um, they're kind of hidden. Another animal that uh, we might see is, this is um, on our way down to Miwok, and this was a young elephant seal that had um, seen everybody on the beach and actually came out of the water and came running up looking to share a lunch. And um, this little um, 
blue spot on its head is some adhesive that's left over from uh, what we call a party hat, um, indicating that he had lived at a, a rescue center, maybe the Marine Mammal Center for a while, and became too habituated to human beings, obviously. So he came running up onto the beach. The kids are really, really excited. This is a group that comes out two days in a row. Uh, they bring all of their third graders out and whoops, sorry about that. And the second, the second day, the classes that came out were really disappointed because they had no seals to see. He uh, relaxed, got up on the beach, um, showered himself with wet sand, we called the Marine Mammal Center and they came out in the afternoon and he was gone. So apparently he was just fine. Um, this is a nudibranch. This is another mollusk that lives without a shell. And um, we'll see, we may see a few at Campbell Cove today. Um, this variety exists there as well as shaggy rugs, but there's more variety of them when we're on the outer coast. This is the most common species that we see out there. This is a opalescent nudibranch or hermacenda, intense electric blue and bright orange serrata. Now this animal um, has sensory organs. These are rhinophores. And if you look at them closely, you can see they're not smooth and they um, are patterned sometimes like um, a uh, spiral, um, thing that's going on here. The reason their pattern like this is to maximize the exposure to the seawater. And they, um, it's like a chemical um, sense that they have. They smell prey, they, they, they smell their way through their environment. They come in different body plans. All of them have um, rhinophores for sensing. Um, this one has these bright orange finger projections all along its back which uh, multitask, they serve as gills. They also serve as the digestive system. They also serve as missile silos for stinging cells as do the anemones, but they aren't born with them. Uh, many of these animals feed on um, uh, cnidarian animals. They are impervious to the stinging cells themselves because of a mucus lining their mouths. They're able to absorb the stinging cells into their own bodies and store them in the serrata here so that they can use them in their own defense. They're brightly colored. They get away with this just like this butterflies do in the terrestrial world. They, it's a warning to other animals. Um, don't touch me, I can hurt you. This guy's a beauty. By the way, um, they're usually just maybe an inch and a half long. Um, this, this again is a macro photograph. This is another with the same body type. This is a shaggy rug. Um, his rhinophores are here. And the serrata, in this case, are a cream color. The first time, now, they not only absorb the stinging cells of their prey, but they also absorb the color of their prey. Um, the first time I saw a pink one was at Campbell Cove where we're going today. And it was startling to me because it looked very, very familiar in terms of its body plan and its shape, but I had never seen that pink color before. And I looked a few inches away, there was a bright pink anemone. So um, this is what it had been feeding on and it absorbed the color of that animal. This is another, this is the Dorid body plan. This is a sea lamb. The rhinophores are here. They have these little tubercles or bumps. And they have this wonderful flower, the rear of the body, and uh, this is their gills. We see these on the outer coast. Whoops. Another dorid is um, the spotted dorid. And um, its rhinophores are not very visible here but this is the plume of gills. And this is a sea clown. You can see how it got its name. They're really kind of clownish looking. And here are the rhinophores here. So they come in a variety of body plans and a variety of colors. They're the butterflies of the intertidal zone and it's a treat when you find them. This is our table. And um, we can bring us to various events. 
Um, one of our docents goes to the Bodega Marine Lab in the morning and picks up 25 gallons of seawater and picks out a collection of animals and algae while um, others of us and staff are assembling the table, setting up the pump and the cooler. And this way we can bring the animals to the students. And this is a end of a field trip. So are there any questions? I see Justin's put in the in the chat here. Um, we're bringing the touch table to the North Bay Science Day on March 11th, and all of you are welcome to join. So they've had up to 8,000 attendees at this event, and it's an opportunity for people to get their hands on experience with these animals. So are there any other questions? Susanna, would you like to talk about some of your experiences with going to the Marine Lab and picking up the touch table? It's just, it's so, just so it the tide table table um, is a little bit hard to set up initially, but even while it's being set up, it it's a magnet for everybody from every age, and um, you don't even. We've even had people that don't speak any English whatsoever, and just that experience of them being able to kind of mosey up to the table and actually touch something when they normally wouldn't even probably go out to the coast is just, it's a fabulous experience for naturalists to see that engagement at the table. And I always learn more. And also the um, the Marine Biology Lab giving us those species to put in the table, that in itself is so interesting because they're taking those animals from our direct coast um, and letting us just care for them a little while in the table. And then we return them back into their tanks. So we're not, um, we're able to get some really interesting species at times and learn um, really directly from the work of the Marine, my, my Marine um, Center. Well, do we have any other questions before going out to uh, Campbell Cove today? Um, uh, one thing that I wanted to mention, oh, I'm sorry, Justin. Well, I was just gonna add uh, for the touch table as well. Um, you know, there's opportunities for shifts uh, to, to show up at the place that the touch table will be. Um, and help with the education there. And then there's also, as Susanna mentioned, um, picking up the organisms. And I think that this year um, there's enough uh, tide pool touch table events already that we will be looking for some people to shadow in that process and learn how to pick up animals and help with that when the when the time is needed. It's logistically something that's can be somewhat complicated, but um, it's a really, really neat program. So we have the North Science, uh, the North Bay Science Discovery Day in March. We have um, the Bodega Bay Fisherman's Festival in April um, and the Bodega Seafood Wine and Art Festival in August on our calendar. And I believe we're setting something up for Guerneville School again too, aren't we? Mm -hmm. And by the way, our, our calendar our tide pool calendar for school trips is full. Um, every possible date between now and going into June, low tide date. And we have, in some cases, we have two groups coming out simultaneously, the two smaller groups. We just stagger their arrival <laughs> times. And so it's a very popular program with the teachers. Um, I just turned one teacher away uh, yesterday. And right now I'm scrambling to find some summer dates for the Boys and Girls Club for this summer. And so it's a very popular program with the schools. They're, they're now booking in the fall before the spring. So we're seeing an awful lot of students out there. 
Stacy, did you have your hand up? Um, yeah, we wanted to double check when you're talking about some species being more um, outer coast, I think you referred to it as. I'm wondering where, what do you mean, like beyond the tide pools, or do you have specific locations you're talking about? Well, where we're going today is inside Bodega Harbor. Mm -hmm. And so um, the tide will be low enough uh, so that we can make our way all the way out to the jetty. The jetty is just like the rocks of the, of the outer coast. Um, there are sea stars, there are sponges, there are tunicates, there are um, chitons, there's um, maybe an octopus. Um, oh, another thing to look for today actually is a, um, it seems to be a nursery for baby flounders. Hmm. And I was really um, surprised to find a tiny baby fish that was translucent and its eyes were, you know, on one side of the head back in 2008. And a couple of years ago, um, one of our docents was um, roving out at Campbell Cove. And she said, oh, look what I found. And she found a whole nursery of them and took a video of them flopping around. And so this was, what, 15 years later. And so um, obviously it is still a nursery for baby flounders. So if you see any little tiny fish, let me know, because I'm really curious about what's going on out there. The outer coast is very, very different because it is subject to all of this incredible wave action. And so the animals that live out there are very, very tough. They've all developed some kind of means of, of, um, of holding on to the rocks in order to survive that wave action. And so there's a different variety of animals that we see out there. The Sonoma Coast is really kind of interesting because it's composed of all these little pocket beaches all mm -hmm. along. And the population of animals is different for each one of those little beaches. You know, it's, it's the particular orientation. It's what else has established itself there. It's, um, if there are more highly competitive animals in the community. Um, Karmet Beach, I don't know what it is about Karmet. I don't know if it's oriented slightly different or what. It's the only place where I've ever seen um, the big red sea urchins. It's the only place where I've ever seen sea cucumbers. Um, it's the only place where I've ever seen the big leaky horn mouth snails. I have to be careful. I'm dyslexic. I keep calling it a horny leaf mouth. <laughs> and it's really a leafy horn mouth. Uh, um, and uh, there are only two places where I've ever seen brittle stars. One is Shell Beach and one is Carmet Beach. And as I said, it's kind of in the middle between Bodega Bay and Jenner. There's something unique about its orientation or the rocks or something there that has, um, that allows you to see animals that don't exist anywhere else along the coast out there. Wow. And Karma was one. You said Karma is at C-A-R-M-E-T? Yes. Okay. I'll and it is one. north of there. it is north of Marshall Gulch in the um orientations folder. There is a list of uh different beaches along the coast. Whether or not there's a restroom there, the maximum tide for exploration. One of them there is Marshall Gulch. Marshall Gulch, the parking lot was only large enough for maybe eight cars. There are no restrooms there, but it is one of the high biodiversity beaches. Um, uh, Marshall Gulch uh, along with Shell Beach. I'm not, I used to visit Shell Beach all the time. We used to bring our, our classrooms there. I don't like it for classrooms as much because um, the way it's concentrated, you get 50 kids down there, that's hundred feet, plus all of our feet, plus the feet of the parents and the docents. And there's really no room for them to spread out. They are stepping from one tide pool into another. And I just started wincing at the damage that was being done to that, that, that environment. And that's why it's an ideal place for a rover because a rover can do some education down there with the public as Karen does. That's one of her favorite beaches. It was one of my favorite beaches to explore but um, we stopped bringing school groups down there for that reason. It's it just the impact of that many people at one time was just 
um, bothersome to witness. That's understandable. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Well, I look forward to seeing you out there this afternoon. Um, we have a, a start time. Oh, yes. go ahead. Uh, can you, can you, I think you're kind of segueing into it, but could you just talk about logistics for meeting in the afternoon? Like where how that's going to work? Oh, okay. So does everybody know where um, Campbell Cove is? Um, did a map go out? Okay. So um, we're going to meet in the parking lot. Um, the very low tide, actually the lowest tide isn't until four o'clock, but it's like a minus one and a half feet. And so um, please, it you know, we say one to three, please stay for the, the duration if you like. Um, we'll be meeting in the parking lot. Be sure to wear shoes that you don't mind getting wet or muddy. Um, I'm bringing a pack with me so that you can see the contents of the pack and there'll be some field guides. I'm also bringing some magnifiers. Karen's bringing some plastic containers uh, to hold specimens that we can pass around. Um, there's restrooms in the parking lot there. We're likely to see a lot of clam diggers out there today. And um, that's always kind of fun. I'm also bringing um, one of the field guides that I really like for that area because it's very big on bivalves. And um, there's even a, um, a key for shows of siphons of the different kinds of plans. And um, we have a document that is in our packs and I'm bringing a couple of extra ones that's called Life Under the Mud. In this case, it's very silty sand. And so one of the things that we'll be seeing are different textures on the sand. Um, will be, they're caused by stickworms. Um, there are little volcanoes that are um, created by innkeeper worms. There's an interesting variety of animals that live under the substrate. And by looking at the photographs in this document on what we're seeing at the surface level of the substrate, we'll be able to identify the animals that are living underneath. When we will be going out over some rocks that are covered with um, chitons and some aggregating anemones and possibly an octopus. So keep your eyes out for what you're stepping on. And the jetty itself is like the rocks of the intertidal on the outer coast. We'll see sea stars, we'll see tunicates. Um, tunicates are interesting animals. Um, they're also um, known as ascidians. They are actually, um, some of them have names like sea pork or sea vomit. They're colonial animals. Um, they don't look like much, but they're our closest relatives out there. And the reason why is that they start life with a primitive notochord or spinal cord. And so they're chordates. And although they just look like little blobs, they're our closest relatives out there. So um, pay them some respect. There are some interesting sponges. Hopefully we'll see some Lewis moon snails today. And those are the big, huge, beautiful shells with the big foot. And um, we'll probably see some evidence um, with empty clam shells with the, the countersunk hole drilled there. So we can meet there at one o'clock. Um, I have to shoot up. I'm in Stinson Beach right now. So um, if I'm a little late, they're doing some road work on Highway 1. So I'll get there as quickly as I can. And Jamila, I know you're unable to make it. And I think Anna is too. So um, we'll catch up with you some other time. Thank you so much. Karen. Yeah, I just mentioned if you didn't see it in chat, if you don't have water boots or muck boots, I'm actually bringing several extra pair. So you're welcome to borrow a pair uh, from me. Great. One thing that I always find helpful is a walking stick, but, you know, especially for balance. But um, 
I'm in my 70s and I have some orthopedic problems. So um, it's a must for me. But it's when I was talking about the three point stance for safety, that's my third point there. Yeah. So if you have a walking stick, be sure to bring it. Yeah, I was concerned about that. How slippery is what we're walking on? It's it's not very slippery at all. Slippery. Okay, yeah. great. But I say that, but bring I have me. not but I have not seen Campbell Cove in the last couple of weeks. And so um, because of the weather that we've had, uh, the conditions could have changed. So um, I, I just take that stick everywhere. Yeah, Karen? Um, Hollis, do you want me to bring a shovel to uh, dig, if in case people want to dig in the mud? Sure, that would be okay. fun. Oh, well. Anything else? Okay, well, I look forward to seeing you this afternoon. Great. All right. Thank you so much, and thank you so much, everyone. Um, I think Hollis and I can stick around for a couple more minutes in case folks have questions, but thanks for joining us, and we'll see you out in Campbell Cove at 1 p.m. <laughs>